Welcome back to the wizard shop and today we're going to check out this really awesome, I didn't expect it to be, but I'm pleasantly surprised, Studebaker Lark. Let's get started. So we got some family coming to town this weekend, no yachting. And I'm kind of glad for that because we get to film this really awesome car. This is a 1960 Studebaker Lark 8, which is VIII. That's what it says on the back. This is from Illinois, and the customer called a while back to schedule this because we've been so busy. We finally were able to find a spot to fit this car in. And when he first described it to Crazy D in the office, he got this Lark that's got an engine swap in it. We'll talk about that here in a minute. I was kind of uh, was like, eh, I don't know about that. That sounds like a disaster. I guess we can take a look at it anyway. But when it was delivered, arrived here at the shop, I hopped in it and started it. And I fully expected it to crank, 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 crank. It's some very poorly done swap, but it wasn't. It fired right up instantly and went into gear perfectly and just tootled right into the shop so smooth and so nice. But I was pleasantly surprised after driving it into the shop, what I expected to be a disaster actually turned out to be very, very cool. We'll go ahead and walk around this thing and check it out. I want you guys to see this thing. I've not seen one of these up close, like right here before. And now that I'm looking at it, I told Mrs. Wizard, I want one. I want one of these Larks. This is amazing. This is really, really cool. Let's take a look. So this is an American car, but you look at the front, it almost looks Mercedes-ish, European. It looks like if you didn't know any better, you'd say, oh, you shipped that from overseas. No, it was made right here in America. And there's a Studebaker logo on the front. As we come around to the side, I remember in the 90s, they came out with the Dodge Intrepid and various other models Chrysler had, the LHS. And one of their key hallmarks was cab forward design where the wheels are moved forward and you have more footboard space. That's not new. Look. It's almost by the front bumper up there, the wheel is. I think that styling looks really, really good. In the 60s, most American cars, the wheel would have been way back here and you'd have six foot of overhang out front. But not these. It's right up there by the bumper. You can see it says Lark 8 on the side. This is a sedan. It is in very, very good shape. The paint is not glossy like water, but it's shiny and it, it's in good shape. The rear definitely has a late 50s feel to it. Small brake lights, just kind of a square boxed rear end. Here is where you fill it up with gas. Kind of cool. So I'm going to open the trunk. With the years of experience I have seeing older cars, the way that I judge a car is I open the trunk and I expect an old car like this just to either be rotted out, completely rusted, or just banged up or beat up. But let's take a look. Look at that, guys. Look at the seams. They're still factory fresh. The original body sealant is still there. The paint is not scratched up or beat up. It's very, very clean in here. As far as rust is concerned, this thing is museum quality. It's really, really nice. So based on looking in the trunk, I can say this is the real deal. This is a really nice Studebaker. This is not a piece of junk. It's not a barn find. It's not some teenage kid's hot rod. It really, truly represents the car and its true character. You don't hear trunks close like that these days. As we go down this side, you can see the chrome is not pitted like so many cars of this era. It's not a giant car. It's not a huge car of the 60s like we think of the American icon cars, Impalas and Chrysler Newports and things. It's actually compact, but I like it that way. Let's go ahead and see if the interior matches the originality of the exterior. So as always, ladies and gents, here we go. Look at that dash, 49,000 miles on this thing. 
and I believe it's just the 49. I don't think it's rolled over. This thing is so, so mint. It's got a few little controls there. Nothing major. Lights, heat, <laughs> wipers, nothing major. It does have some additions added to it. We can see that it does have an aftermarket cruise control. And you will see that it also has gotten an additional radio because at that time you would have gotten only an AM station. So I can see why they would have updated that to something more modern. The dash is a leather dash and it is original. So many cars of this era were, they had steel dashes, which might be very durable, but obviously not good if you are going to be in a wreck. It does have a large speaker on the right hand side and in the center, if we press our button, is our glove box. And ironically, it does have two lovely little circles there so you can put a small beverage. They have added some other gauges, some oil pressure, water temp down below. The door panels are in amazing shape. They're kind of a taupe color. There's a lot of browns in here. We move up to the headliner. It's in also just phenomenally great shape and it's got a fun texture to it as well. I do believe that they've replaced these because these look extra fluffy. They have the visors are, I don't believe those are original. And some of that piping from the visor is on the doors as well. But as we move down to the seats, they are in perfect shape. And they're just too perfect, they have been restored. As we move to the back seat, again, seats have been done. They have added seat belts as well because they probably did not come with those originally. And then our back deck has some carpet back there. They added some new speakers to get some better sound out of the new stereo system. As we end up with the steering wheel, this is what you call a steering wheel. This thing is massive. And one reason for that, of course, is this doesn't have power steering. And so it helps when you're cranking around to get around the corner, makes it easier with that very bigger steering wheel. Let's get this up on the lift wizard. I'm curious to see what's under the hood. So originally this car would have had a 2.8 inline six or 4.2 V8, a very small V8. That's not what it has today. Let's go ahead and open the hood and see what's under here. What did they do to this car? Let's take a look. Here we go, guys. For anybody who's a gearhead knows that's a small block Chevy. Is it a 305, a 283, a 350? I don't know. So as far as just displacement, I'm not too sure. I could look up the casting numbers on the block and do all that if I wanted to, but I know definitely it's a small block Chevy. And really it wouldn't matter unless I'm getting pistons or something. If I had to get a water pump or intake, it, it really wouldn't matter all that much. I don't think I'm gonna be having to do anything major to this engine. It does have what says a Weber carburetor. It's actually Edelbrock. If you look on the very front of the carburetor, it has a red emblem. It says Edelbrock, your typical Edelbrock four barrel. And it has, you can see there's the cruise control hook up here, transmission kick down, and then there's our throttle cable. All three are there. I'm not too sure which engine this would have had originally, if it would have been a V8 or an inline six. Here's our heater core. You guys have seen the Range Rover video we did where we did a heater core, evaporator core, and all that. We had to pull the entire dash apart. It was days of work. I wish they would do things like this today. It's right here. You don't even have to touch the dash. It's probably an hour job or something. It works. It works very well. It doesn't have to be hidden far away so much that it costs thousands to fix it. Here we have our cruise control servo and the cable wraps around the firewall over to the throttle. It does have Shorty headers on it. Probably that way so it clears the, the body. If we look over at the steering gearbox, you can see that it is not power steering. It's the old Armstrong or strong arm steering as they call it, which really isn't too bad on this car. If you look around, you can tell that it was, it was actually done very well when they swapped this engine in. It's not some backyard swap where you just grab pieces of metal or parts off the shelf or whatever you got on hand to make it work. It actually was thought out and planned and done well. But as you guys are interested as I am, I want to see the underneath. Let's see what this thing looks like on the lift. Man, this thing just starts right up. I mean, instantly. 
All right, let's see here. Now I know I'm making a big deal about it starting right up. It's like, okay, wizard, we get it. It starts right up. That doesn't mean a whole lot. Yes, it does. Because when you do an engine swap or you do major surgery on a car like this, that's one of those things that it, if you don't do it right, it doesn't work. It doesn't do that well. I've been in so many cars with engine swaps where it cranks and cranks and cranks, or you gotta hold a wire, or you gotta do this to get it to start, or, and it's a botched job, basically. But when I get in and it starts not even one or two revolutions, I know they've got the ignition system correct, they got the timing correct, the choke is set up, everything is absolutely dialed in. So that does mean a lot to me. So let's get this thing on the lift. So this thing literally just came in. This is the first time together we're going to check this out and look underneath. I haven't looked underneath of it yet, so we'll be experiencing this together. So one thing that's pretty interesting to see on a 1960 car, not a 60s, but 60, like the beginning of the 60s, is a sway bar. We see that it's got links here that bring it down and it connects to the control arm. That's pretty cool. You can tell it's been greased all of its life. There's from the grease circs, there's some grease around there. These have drum brakes all the way around. Nothing's loose there. So these are the days of grease circs. I have many customers, our older gentleman comes in with newer vehicles, says make sure to get all the grease circs. And it's like, there are none on newer cars. But they're used to the days of this. Let me show you guys. Grease circ, grease circ, grease circ. Let's go around to the other side. Grease Zerk. Another one. And another one. There's seven Grease Zerks on one wheel. These cars were made to be greased and kept on the road as long as possible. It was before the day of if the part failed, throw it in the trash and buy another one. Stop trying to service the vehicle, just throw the parts away and put a new one on. That was not the mentality in 1960. You would rebuild or repair parts that went bad, your generator, uh, even spindles and things. You could put new shims or new, new bushings or things in it and rebuild it and put it back together. Today we throw stuff away and it's designed that way. But that's why there's so many Zerks. They want the parts to last as long as possible. The companies really wanted to have a hallmark that their cars last a long time. Today it is after three years, whether it be Chevy, Ford, Honda, Toyota, any of these companies, they expect you to get rid of your car and go buy a new one. Stop trying to make them last so long. But this is back in the day when they wanted it to last a long time. So let's go ahead and continue on. Look, more grease zerks. They're everywhere on this car. I mean, they're all over the place. So there's a lot of grease here. That's from being serviced and a little bit of grease oozes out over time. And that's over years and years of services. I don't see this as a problem. So here we have a mount for a pitman arm, and it connects two tie rods. We can see the exhaust that they made to fit this small block Chevy in. And there's a little bit of a seepage from an oil change, but really not too bad. Here we have our steering gearbox. And then we have a drag link that goes up there to that arm. It actually transfers the steering motion under the oil pan. It's kind of interesting. And look! another grease zerk. There's nothing in this area that's just pouring fluid out, just little seepages and everything. And here on this wheel, all the same situation. Nothing really loose. The shocks are good. I get on drum brakes, we always look at the bottom to see if there's fluid pouring out right here. That would be the brake cylinder inside is leaking brake fluid. These are nice and dry. Here we have the transmission, and again, it has a little bit of seepage going on. There's a lot of seepages going on that we need to address, and really would have to clean it all off, 
and then go drive it and see exactly where it's coming from. But that's definitely a GM transmission. And it mounted perfectly. It looks like they welded this little support here, the little mount bracket for the transmission mount to make it all line up and work. So I can see that the output seal of the transmission is leaking. We'll have to take that off and replace it. But you can see it has a speed sensor right here on the drive shaft. It's got little metal dots that are wired to the drive shaft and there's a magnetic sensor here that picks it up. That's probably for the cruise control. So you can see it has a speedometer cable here, but that does not transfer the data that it needs for the cruise control. So this is how the cruise control knows how fast you're going. That's the reason that that's there. This is Scott's shaft. Look at that. Put, even put his name on it. Interesting. <laughs> Let's see if Scott's shaft's got any play in it. Well, it's all good. I, I don't know if I appreciate you touching someone else's shaft. Okay, well, we won't be doing it. I won't touch it anymore. Thank you, dear. We have the two-into-one exhaust that comes out to a nice quiet muffler here. It, it, it dumps right before the axle. I probably would like to see some exhaust tips out the back, but I guess that was probably a cheaper and easier thing to do. We do see the pinion seal is leaking on this differential. We'll have to replace that. That will not be Chevy parts. That will definitely be Studebaker parts. These bolts you see that are shiny bolts, those are there because those are seat belts that were added so that the vehicle is safer. It probably didn't even have seat belts in the back at all. And they added those so whoever sits in the back won't go flying in a wreck. Shocks look good on this side. No leaks on the brakes, nothing loose there. We have leaf springs in the back, no coil springs. This is just a standard solid axle. I'm not seeing a bunch of rust, hardly at all. It still has a coating on it, which is probably what saved it. Here's our frame. Shock's good here, no leaks on the brakes. I know the brakes work, they work very well. There's our frame. Here's our gas tank, fuel filter, and it runs along the frame to an aftermarket electric fuel pump right here. I can hear it running when the engine's running. So that's the fuel pump. It is a Holley electric fuel pump. So that's pretty cool. I have one more thing on the frame I wanna show you guys before we drop this down, and it is old technology. Let's take a look. There's our brakes underneath the floorboard. If you want to top off the brake fluid, you have to peel back the carpet, remove that circular cap, then you can get to the brakes. That's old world technology where the brakes are on the frame rail. But they work good, so I don't have any problem with that. Let's get this thing on the ground. So with the years of experience that I have seeing all kinds of botched swaps and good swaps and broken engines and broken cars left and right, I can say with relative authority that whoever did this years ago, whoever did this swap was probably an older gentleman who was a retired professional mechanic. They did everything properly. They got everything set up properly. It's tuned properly. Everything works. It's not broken after two or three years of use. It's still running today. This was not done by a teenage kid in the backyard in, in grandpa's barn. This was done very well. So I'm really, really pleased. Like I mentioned, I was fully expecting a disaster. I'm pleasantly surprised with this car. It was done very well. They did not completely redo or modify the car to where it's not even hardly a Studebaker anymore. They only added what was necessary to make it comfortable usable on today's highways, and yet left everything else intact just like a 1960s Studebaker should look. So we're going to address the few leaks that it has, make sure the brakes are in proper order. We'll pull all the drums off and make sure they're good. That's why it's here. The customer just bought it and they want to make sure everything's safe, everything was done well before they take it out and start cruising. And based on what I see, it was done very well. Now this kind of a swap, if you were to pay a shop to do this, it's not going to be two grand. It's probably going to be ten or fifteen thousand dollars or more. It's not like Legos where you swap a couple blocks out and then now you have something different. It's not cheap. It's not easy. 
When you alter a car like this one's been altered, there's complete systems that have to be redone. You have to think about safety. You have to think about reliability and also liability. You swap someone's engine out and you do a poor job and it causes an accident. The shop can be held liable. This thing was done very well and I'm very happy that it's here. In fact, so much so, I, like I said, I told Mrs. Wizard, I'm thinking about looking for one of these. She would like a bullet nose. Or what was the other one you said? The pickup. A Studebaker pickup? Yes, yes. Yeah, well maybe we, can, maybe we can get one of each. Um, you have enough cars already, like the Chevelle over there, and I still want my 308 running. Well that one's mine, too. I guess we can share it. <laughs> okay. I would let you have the 308 if I could get a really cool Lark. Maybe. Okay. If you're curious what kind of tools we used, or tools that I would use to do the swap on this, check my Amazon affiliates link in the description below. We get a small cut and we really appreciate it. Make sure to hit the subscribe button because there's so many more cool projects to come. There's cars coming from all over the country now, guys. All over the place. So make sure to hit the subscribe button. Thanks for watching. Mm -hmm.